welcome to this first commissioning show. Uh, my name's Michael Dixon, I'm uh, a local GP and I've been involved in commissioning for more years than I care to remember. Uh, the commissioning show is going to keep you up to date with what's going on in commissioning, but more than that we're going to tell you as it is, warts and all. Now I'm going to be talking to some of the big cheeses, the ministers, the people from the National Commissioning Board, Monitor, but the focus is going to be on the commissioners, the clinical commissioners, what they're doing, what they're thinking and what they're trying to achieve. One of the knowns in the current system is that we're going to have 212 commissioning groups, they're going through authorisation at the moment, they'll be going live in April and every GP, every practice will be a member. So there's no escape for any of us. From now on, we've got to do the best for our patients. We're going to be taking a look at the whole issue of why clinical commissioning? What's it trying to achieve? Will it make a difference? Is it a good or a bad thing? We're also going to be looking at why GPs need to take it seriously. What's it going to do for them? What's it going to do for patients? And will it improve the health of your local population? And then we're going to take a look at some examples of clinical commissioning in action, which show the potential for this and the future to help our patients. We're now going to go to the very smallest clinical commissioning group in the country, in a deprived area relative to the rest of the country, and we're going to hear the views of the clinical commissioning group chair there. I'm Peter Wolczynski, I'm chair of Corby Clinical Commissioning Group, uh, it, which is the smallest CCG in the country, looking after 67,000 patients, and we're based in Corby, as the name suggests, in Northamptonshire. I've also been a uh, general practitioner since 1981. So 30 plus years now. But clinical commissioning matters an awful lot because clinicians can drive change in a way that managers never could do. GP commissioning is about local commissioners planning and providing services to their patients based upon need. And it matters because local clinicians know their patients best. They understand the local health economy. They understand on a day-to-day -day basis the needs of their patients. I still, as a clinician, I spend two and a half days a week in the surgery. I still see 125 patients per week. If I look at my career to date, I've probably seen 300,000 patients over the 30 years that, I work, that I've worked. And I think that as a result of that, I understand what their wants are, which may or may not be met, but I certainly understand what their care needs are. For the last 10 years, I have been frustrated by my inability to change services for my patients that would benefit them, benefit the health economy, benefit the nation, because the decisions that are being made are being made by non-clinicians who do not understand that unique doctor-patient relationship. Clinical commissioning will involve an enormous change in the role of AGP, and in particular general practice as the sort of volume component of community care. If all clinical commissioning is about is moving people from one desk in an office to a new desk in a new office and a new organisation, then there will be complete uh, disengagement by local clinicians. If it actually means that local clinicians get involved in the development of services, the planning of services, the purchasing of services and the provision of those services, then this will mean a transformational change in the way that care is provided for our patients. Quality of care is what drives clinicians. I get a buzz at the end of the day about not the quantity of care I provide, but the quality of care I provide. And given the long-term relationship that I as a GP have with my patients and their families, the real buzz I get is when the day after I've seen somebody or a week later I'm in the shop and somebody comes up to me and says, Doc, you saw my mum last week. Thanks for seeing her. She's a lot better. You sorted her out. She feels great now. And I can go home that day thinking, I've done a good job. Quality of care will become increasingly important and will become the key driver of the reforms and transformational change that we as clinical clinicians will lead, particularly as a result of the North Staffordshire problems and the Francis report. And the one thing that will drive clinical commissioning will be quality of care. In my organisation, a small organisation, a clinical commission group looking after 67,000 patients, 
We have had brilliant engagement from our local GPs because of clinical and managerial leadership in the organisation, because of a desire to improve care for our patients, because of a vision that we have about how we can offer more care for our patients locally. As a direct result of that, my GPs have bought into clinical commissioning. They understand their role as clinical commissioners. Many of them are actually enthused by their role as clinical commissioners and the opportunities it offers to change their working lives and to change the quality and quantity of services they can offer to their patients. My GPs talk about their CCG rather than the CCG. And so we've managed to bring the benefits of both a, a statutory body or certainly a statutory body from the 1st of April, along with the benefits of a membership organisation. So my local clinicians have ownership, they feel that they're involved, they feel that their decisions, their views, their desires to improve care for their patients is actually listened to. We set up a dedicated home visiting service uh, in the middle of the uh, winter last year at a time when our local health economy was struggling, where our hospitals were on black alert, where local medical directors were saying that lives were at risk and that service was set up within one week. That's an example of how rapidly clinical commissioning can make changes. This service picks up urgent home visits in the afternoon when GPs traditionally have problems visiting because they've already got fully booked surgeries or fully booked emergency clinics. It enables patients to be seen, assessed at home, and ideally managed at home where they want to be, because at the time they're seen, we're able to set support services in, we're able to get district nursing services in, we're able to get intermediate care teams in, because if you leave that visit till 6 or 6.30 at the end of an evening surgery, there is very little that either GP can do other than admit a sick patient. And we're saving about two admissions per day. The savings that this service generates over the year will be somewhere in the region of £300,000 uh, for, for a very simple tweak to what we're doing. So from the Midlands to London we're going to now ask Dr Kenneswani, who's a, a veteran of clinical commissioning, was the PEC chair of Waltham Thoris PCT and the question we're going to ask him is will clinical commissioning make a difference for his patients? Clinical commissioning can make a significant difference to patients' lives. For example, if they need to access diagnostics, um, for example, ultrasound or MRI examination, they can do so in the community. I think more importantly, if, if patients have chronic conditions such as diabetes, heart failure, asthma, most of this care can be undertaken in the community. Previously, a lot of the care was hospital-based. Now we're able to um, work with consultants to provide care in the community nearer to the patient's home. Um, we, uh, we are integrating our service with social services and the voluntary sector just to make sure that the patient is getting integrated care, not necessarily different levels of care, which previously might have been the case. So hopefully there are a significant number of patient benefits, um, which is a significant advance for the NHS. We've developed in Corby an urgent care centre, and in this, and this urgent care centre brings together the concept of observation couches for children and adults, along with diagnostics that are not routinely available to community services, in particular x-ray services, ultrasound services, and pathology services that are available eight to eight, seven days a week, 365 days a year which means that I as a GP can now feel much more confident about my patients being seen, being assessed, being appropriately investigated, treatment started, observed and then discharged home. I would be delighted if our patients can be more involved in commissioning. The areas they can be involved in is, for example, helping monitor the services that are provided, particularly in terms of patient experience, because using that knowledge we can continually improve the services. Um, patients can, can also be involved in regularly uh, giving us information as a reference group, either in person in patient participation groups or electronically to give us as much feedback as, as, as possible. Um, patient and customer feedback has been the norm in all other services. We would really like to strengthen that as, as part of clinical commissioning and, and I think that that will make the services stronger 
and the patient, the patient services, particularly the patient experience, much more effective. Uh, we've always underused patients' uh, knowledge, but they're the people who experience the service and have the knowledge, and we should feel very privileged to take that on board. If commissioning is about anything, it's about changing the way we provide services. That's the only way we're going to make ends meet and also give a better deal for our patients. The third sector has an awful lot to offer and we're going to hear today from some of those involved in offering third sector services. I would really like to work um, hand in hand with the local CCGs and what I really would want to do is to break the old mindsets that used to be around, um, that I'm there to um, be commissioned to provide certain services. I want to turn that round, I want to be able to talk to them, to, to understand fully what they need, to understand fully what the, their, their patients need, and to actually break through that sort of third party barrier so that I can actually engage more intimately with the people that I'm supplying the services to and reflect those people people's needs and choices back to the clinical commissioning group so we can have a proper dialogue about the services that people really deserve. Clevo is the charity leaders network and a large number of my chief executive members run health and social care organisations play a very big role in the health service either as advocates for patients or in delivering services or in providing uh, medical research. I believe clinical commissioning um, could herald a real revolution in how we provide health and social care in, in, in this country and I know that it's important that we do that because the health service faces huge challenges. Um, we've got the advances of medical science, limited resources, demographic change and patients wanting a bigger role in their own um, health and social care. Big, big challenges against very tight budgets. So the new clinical commissioning groups have got quite a challenge, um, but a challenge on behalf of the patients in, in their areas, in their local areas. And one of the things I like about it is that, you know, doctors know their patients and they know their local communities and they know the needs in a much better and more direct way than the old bureaucracies in, in the PCTs and the health service so if they use their new freedoms to commission um, better then that could mean big changes in the health service so it's very important and uh, it's very important for clinical commissioning groups to take that power and to commission differently and better I think clinical commissioning groups need to think very seriously about where they spend their money. Is it too much in uh, hospitals and not enough in prevention work and in supporting people with long-term conditions, for example? Um, we know that uh, the majority of people in hospital beds are over 60, and we know many of them should not be in hospital beds but cared for at home. We also know three-quarters of the budget of the health service is spent on long-term conditions and spent badly. So the new groups should be looking at that and thinking about how they use charities and voluntary organisations to deliver that care better. We deliver more cost-effective care for people with long-term conditions, for older people. Um, it's more patient and citizen focus and we can have a real alliance between charities and the clinical commissioning groups. Uh, let's work together. It's a strong alliance on behalf of uh, Better Health and, uh, and for the patients themselves. I think there's a real opportunity now for us to become more fully integrated with healthcare in general. In the past I found that, uh, for example, through the commissioning process, which is very often through a contractual tendering process, it keeps us pretty much at arm's length from the people that we're in, trying to engage with in, in, in the commissioning. Now there's an opportunity where we could actually become, as I think they say now, embedded more within the health service and the type of, um, sort of services that we want to provide to people. We can actually get in there, break the mindsets and, and do some real, real good in the community. What this will mean for patients and the people we support um, into the future is a better integration of services. Services that are relevant to them, services that they have asked for, services that they would naturally choose and want to come back to. So why clinical commissioning in the first place? As a GP of 30 years, I see it uh, as an extension of my role in whole person care for the patient in surgery 
to a role for the whole community in improving the health of the community, stopping people falling ill, helping them to help each other in terms of health, and when they are unwell, helping them to self-care, and then only providing the professional service that they require at the right level. And only if we get that right are we ever going to get ends meeting in the health service. For me, in general practice, it's a sort of coming home because we've been independent contractors outside the system, having very little say about how the services are provided and how the health of our patients could be improved. Now we're coming inside it, but with power comes responsibility. So on the one hand, we're going to be given a leadership role as we've never had before, an opportunity which we've never been offered before. On the other, it will mean that we have to take that responsibility. We have to become as responsible for the health service, being sustainable, working, delivering better services as everybody else. I think that's quite a heroic role. It's quite a frightening role. It means we have to balance the individual with the greatest good of the greatest number. But I think if we're not prepared to do that, then we're not really fulfilling our role as doctors and clinicians.